Welcome to the Leadernomics Show and today we have with us Roger Dawson, one of the premier negotiators in the world possibly. Roger, welcome to the show. Great, Great to have to you here with, with us. You. How are you? You know, one, one of the interesting things is many people tell us that negotiations are a critical element in terms of leadership. Uh, is that true and uh, how is that so? Absolutely. The truth of the matter is we're negotiating all the time. I don't think many people realize that because some people will say to me, I don't negotiate because the price of what I sell is fixed. Mm. Well, negotiating to me is not the art of making concessions. It's the art of not having to make concessions. Okay. So if you don't have a lot of price flexibility in what you're selling, you need to be a much better negotiator than someone who does. Mm. Neither is negotiating just for crisis situations like hijackings mm. and prison riots right. and that kind of thing. Yep. We're negotiating all the time. And if we know how to do it right, if we know how to structure win-win negotiations, so mm. not only do we get what we want, but they get what they want too, not only are we going to be a lot more successful in life, but a lot of the pressure and the friction will go out of our lives. And, and how is that? So, I mean, we understand in business you negotiate. We understand in crisis you negotiate. But where else in life would there be negotiation? Oh, from the morning you get up. I bet you've been through half a dozen negotiations already. Uh, where are we going to have breakfast? Which movie are you going to see tonight? Okay, so with it's the family, with the kids. Okay, okay, I see. And and how do we get to win-win? I mean, because uh, you know, the, many times in negotiations we think one person wins and one person loses, right? Uh, the negotiator generally, the better negotiator yes. generally wins, right? Uh, what I teach is called power negotiating, which says that from the way that you negotiate, mm -hmm. you can get what you want in a negotiation, but you have the other person feeling that they won in the negotiation. And, and how does that happen? Well, it does. it's from the way that you negotiate. For example, uh, you never say yes to the first proposal because if you say yes to the first proposal, they automatically think, I could have done better mm -hmm. or something must be wrong here or yep. both of those yep. things. Yep. You uh, always ask for more than you expect to get for half a dozen different reasons, but one of which is you might just get it. And the only way you're going to find out is to ask. So well, well, all of these really things I teach, there's about 20 tactics that I teach that okay. are all designed to that one end to uh, impress the other person that they are winning in the negotiation. Okay. And let's, let's zoom in on this uh, ask for more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one reason is you might get it. Uh, but then the likelihood is, it's, you know, some people think it's crazy, right? Why? I mean, ask for more, I'm never going to get it, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, what, would, what would be some other reasons why we should do, do that? Well, for one thing, it makes it easier to get what you really want. Mm. A while back, my older son Dwight came to me and he said, Dad, could I borrow your Corvette tonight? Yep. Now, that's a fast two-seater sports car. That's right. And I said, well, Dwight, I don't know. That's a pretty fast car. I don't think I'd feel comfortable with you driving around all night in the Corvette. Mm. And he looked really disappointed. And he said, well, could I borrow the minivan then? I said, well, all right, I guess I don't have a problem with you borrowing the minivan. Okay. And I didn't think anything of it until half an hour later, I looked out into the driveway. Dwight plays bass guitar with this group. He's loading these huge loudspeakers into the back of the minivan. Mm -hmm. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no intention of borrowing the Corvette. He just knew, ask for more than expect to get. Makes it a lot easier to get what you really want. Mm. So you might just get it. It makes it easier to get what you really want. If you're selling something, it raises the perceived value of your product or mm. service. If a salesperson says, well, this price is such and such, but for you, I'll give it for this, yep. they've discounted the perceived value of that product or service. Mm. As you keep the full number up there, in writing, if you possibly can, that's one of the keys to credibility. People mm. believe mm. what they see in writing. <coughs> Let it sink in as the true value. If you have to make any concessions, make right. them reluctantly, make the other person right. work for them. The reason that international negotiators say ask for more than expect to get is it's creating a climate where the other person can have a win with you. Mm. If you go in with your very best offer up front, there's no way that they can negotiate with you okay. yep. and feel that they won. Okay. And inexperienced negotiators always want to do that. This is the salesperson who's saying to their sales manager, I'm going out on this big proposal today. I know it's going to be competitive. Let me cut the price up front, otherwise we won't stand a chance of mm. getting it. Experienced negotiators know the power of asking for more, uh, reluctantly backing off of that position so that the other person feels they won. I see. Okay, yeah. And one more reason for asking for more, it prevents deadlocks when you're dealing with an egotistical person. Hmm. If you're dealing with someone who's proud of their ability to negotiate and you don't give them room to have a win, 
the negotiations true, true. would deadlock on you. That's right. You know, you also say that negotiations actually help you increase profits in your business. Oh, absolutely, because a negotiated dollar is a bottom line profit dollar. Mm -hmm. All of your expenses are going to stay the same whether right. you negotiate this or not. So a negotiated dollar is a bottom line profit dollar. Just last week I was in Portland, Oregon uh, teaching an oil distribution company how to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Their profit margin is half of 1%. If gasoline is $4 a gallon, mm. then uh, they make uh, right. a half of 1 cent on that. Yep. So if they were to improve their negotiating skills by 1%, just That's raise huge. their selling prices by 1%, mm. they would triple their bottom line income because it's a bottom line profit dollar. Mm. But you know, a lot of people say, give this excuse that I'm not the negotiation, negotiated type. Uh, you know, I just don't have that. You know, I just hate to do that. You know? um, <laughs> There's no such thing as a born negotiator. I mean, read the birth announcements in the newspaper. You'll never see one that says born at the hospital today a negotiator was born. There's no such thing. It's a learned skill, and that's what I've been doing for the last how do you learn this? years. How, how do you learn this skill then? Uh, well, you come how to my you seminars learn that skill, for one. <laughs> <laughs> or read my books or listen okay. to my uh, audio programs. So yourself, right? You know, you've been doing this for 29 years now, right? Uh, what are some lessons you learned along the journey uh, you know, that helped you become the negotiator you are today? Well, what I teach is really street smarts. I didn't go to a college to learn it. I just, I was a real estate broker in California, president mm. of a large company, 28 offices, 540 mm. sales associates. And in the real estate industry, you have a fallout rate of about 20%. Okay. That is, means that from the time the buyer and the seller sign the contract, to, to the time. time it actually closes, you lose about 20% of that business right. for one reason or another. Yep. They can't get the finance, you know, they, yep. they have a falling True. out. Yep. And I, when I took over the company, they were doing about uh, $400 million worth of business, but 20% of that was falling out. Mm. So I figured if I could teach the people how to negotiate better, then we would pick up that extra business. And mm. we cut that fallout right in half just from better negotiating skills. Mm. It's not complicated, it's yep. not rocket science, but it's something that is not taught in high schools or colleges right. for some reason. So Every seminar I give, I ask how many of you took a course in negotiation. negotiating in uh, <laughs> college or high school, and almost never does anybody say, yes, I mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. It's such an important skill, so it's such a shame. Uh, you've written 16 books, right? Mm -hmm. What's your favorite then? 17, 17? Actually, one came out uh, just this last week. Oh, okay, what's, what's that book about? It's about problem solving, secrets of power problem solving. Is there a relation between negotiation and problem solving? No, not really. Um, I've formerly written a book on decision making and mm. it's more related to that, okay. the solving problems with, with correct decision methods. What are, what are one, two key skills that, you know, if, if you're a young person uh, and you want to become a better negotiator, what are one, two things, you know, maybe in, in, my, in my youth or young adult that I need to pick up or practice so that I become a better negotiator? Well, one thing is you cannot be conflict averse. Okay. You've got to kind of enjoy a the good banter. tussle. You know? yep. Uh, yep. Uh, I, I train a lot of uh, doctors, physicians in the United States, and all of them are conflict averse. They hate arguing yep. with people. So they always say to me, Roger, I don't, can't be too tough a negotiator because I have to build long-term relationships with mm. people. What they're saying is I want people to like me. And I don't think when you're in a negotiation you want people to like you. They, you want people to respect you. Mm. And they respect you when you have good negotiating skills mm. and you stand up for what you believe in. Mm. A country like in Asia, right, specifically in Asia, we have a culture of um, being nice. In, in that whole negotiation space, right? I mean, do you see a difference between the West and, and here in Asia where it's everybody... It's not because you're Asian, it's because you're a former British colony. Oh, we, <laughs> we taught you good manners and okay. politeness. That's why you're so nice. Yeah, well, what happened to Americans? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, Asians have very good bonding. Uh, we bond generally well with, with people. But one of the things we, we, fa we hate to face conflict. Uh, how do we actually overcome that? Yes, you, you've got to think of negotiating as a game to be played. If you were playing racquetball with the other person, you would do everything you could within the, uh, the rules of the game to, to win. Back, yeah. So why roll over and be compliant mm. when you're in a business negotiation? Mm. 
No, you stand up for what you want and you have the negotiating skills to get it. What's the favorite book you wrote uh, of the 17? Well, Secrets of Power Negotiating has been the big seller. That's mm -hmm. uh, just gone into its third edition now, which is very unusual for a book. It's been 15 years on the best song list. So mm. That's been good for me. <laughs> if, if, if I were to ask you, you know, one or two, assuming I'm a college graduate, I just graduated, I'm coming out in the workforce, you know, one or two pieces of advice you'd give to me uh, as I get into this workforce? Well, I think negotiating skills are very impressive to potential employers. I think if you can say to them, I have training in negotiating, I know how to negotiate, that's very impressive because a lot of those employers don't know how to negotiate, they have mm. trouble with it. So if you can impress them with your negotiating skills, that goes a long way. Mm. What advice would you give a CEO of a company? Um. I <laughs> train your people in negotiating. Um, it's, it's so critical to the bottom line profit of the company. Mm. You know, when you were doing that whole real estate business, was there something be, you know, in your past that enabled you to be successful in that role? Well, actually, I got into real estate almost by accident. Uh, I had worked for 13 years for a big department store chain in the United States. And they had transferred me around uh, frequently. Every yep. two years or so, they transferred me. So I would buy a house, and when I moved, I would buy another one and rent the first one out. So soon I had four houses that I had rented out. Okay. And it suddenly occurred to me after 13 years, this is how slow I am to catch hmm. on. It took me 13 <laughs> years to figure out that I, I was making more money owning this real estate than I was working full time for this company. Hmm. So that's when a light went on okay. and I said, I don't want to be in the department store business anymore. I want to be in real estate where I'll have access to to uh, good deals in real estate. So I got into that and that's when everything started to, to come, come change into place. for me. Yeah. But how did you grow it from such a small business to such a big one? Uh, well, I didn't own the company. The company was there, but okay. uh, it's a very cyclical business. You make a lot of money in the good years and you, you lose a lot of it in the bad years. So I was in it from uh, some of the best years, 1976, to some of the worst years, 1982. But I found out in real estate I could make in a month what it took me a year to earn in the department store business. And then when I went into the speaking business, I found out I could make in a day what it would take me a month <laughs> in real estate or a year in the retail business. There's an expression in real estate that says changing use changes value. If you have a property, it goes up gradually in mm -hmm. value because mm -hmm. of inflation or scarcity. Right. Right. If you change the use of that building, like you take a house and you get it zoned commercial, it dramatically jumps in value. That's right. If you took an apartment building and converted it into condominiums and sold to condominiums, that change in use changes value. Mm. And I think people are like that mm. too. They don't realize very often that I, I'm in a rut here. I've been doing the same thing now over for over, yeah. 15 years and I'm not I'm getting increases in pay that only equal the, uh, the amount rate. of inflation. Yeah. If they would realize that they have talents that they haven't explored yet, mm, there mm. are things they can learn to do and be expert at, they would see that exponential growth in their income. Mm. Changing use changes value. No, that's true. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that's, that's very true. If you could give one piece of advice uh, to all our viewers out there, what would it be? Well, in negotiating skills, there's one thing that is the most important thing you can learn. And that is that you have power if you can convince the other side that you're prepared to walk away. Uh, we call it walk away power in the mm. seminars. Mm. Uh, it's the number one pressure point in negotiations. And you give yourself walk away power by developing options before you go into the negotiation. the negotiation. Let's say that you're buying a piece of real estate. You found the home you want to buy. It's the home, only right? home in town that will keep your family happy. Mm. The smartest thing you can do before you start negotiating is find two other houses you'd be almost as happy with. Mm. It doesn't mean you're not going to get the one you want, but it does mean you'll be a more powerful negotiator because you're sitting there thinking, well, I hope the seller will be reasonable with me, but if they're not, I've got these other options that look good. And the other side can always sense when you have options mm, like that. Mm, so mm. that gives you power, power in the negotiation. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot. We've been speaking to Roger Dawson, a premier negotiation expert uh, out here in the world. Roger, it's been great talking to you. Thank My you again. My pleasure. Thank you. Good to All be with best. you.